um, student, because I was interested to hear you talk about the, the students' self-leadership. Do you use students as mentors for younger students coming on? Is there any sort of, um, sort of support that comes through the students to those who are just entering? As part of the um, development program, yes, we use um, student mentorship. Mm -hmm. So what we do is um, we recruit second and third year students to volunteer to mentor the first years that are coming in. And that's a program that we run for all the undergraduates, be they MBCHB or um, the other professions, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and so forth. And um, students are very enthusiastic about it. So each student who is a mentor will mentor a group of students, maybe six or seven or eight, and um, just assist them with settling in, you know, into the year and into the program. So that's, yeah, that's one of the programs that we run. So, so this academic support, what form does it take? Is, is apart, apart from the mentorship, or do they have tutors, or, or do they have a... a additional sessions to do? Or? The academic support program is much more structured than mm -hmm. that. For instance, in the old curriculum, what happened was they did the first, the preclinical years. It was a program which consisted of three preclinical years and then the three clinical clerkships. So in the old curriculum, the academic support program was structured so that they did those first three years over four years. Mm -hmm. and the load was then lightened. So in their first year, they didn't do all the um, first year courses. And then in the second year, they straddled that. That then provided curriculum space to actually put in programs for skills development, you know, the different literacies and so forth, and to work with that and try and assist them. What happens in the new curriculum, because it is semesterized, and we also changed it because um, in the old one, students either came into the extended program or into the six-year program straight from high school. So when they arrived, they went into one, and they couldn't change from the extended one to the um, six-year program. So now, everybody goes into the first semester. Yeah. And we use that as a diagnostic semester to determine who needs the academic support. So whereas in the old, we used performance in school mm -hmm. to determine who, who needed support. Now we use performance in first year, and we think educationally that's more sound. And then what they then do is, instead of progressing into the second semester of first year, they then go into what we call the intervention program. Not Clankler, let me ask you, how, what percentage of graduates here at Cape Town are female? I believe it's closer to 60%. In the UK, there's a great worry at the moment, because we're about that level too now, that women are less productive and perhaps less valuable in medicine because they have to, to balance things. What's the approach here in South Africa to that? Is there concern? Well, it hasn't been expressed in so many words. South Africans have learned to be politically correct. <laughs> well, probably the most politically correct country and uh, gender equality is an issue that has become quite important. And I think rather than see it as a problem, people are beginning to see it as something that just needs to be addressed. And for instance, in dermatology, there is a program where um, women and mothers of young children can specialize part-time. It takes a lot longer, mm -hmm. but there is what they call a five-eighths program where they work for five hours um, in the morning. I mean, five hours a day. And, but it takes a lot longer to specialize. But it, I think in the end, for people who are managers, is better because a lot of the work happens in the morning anyway. Um, there was a similar program in Oxford where I spent a bit of time, and it worked very well. I mean, mothers of young children and even male primary caregivers were also part of this program, and they could work maybe, say, three days a week, and it depends on how you structure it. But it seems to work, and I was part of that program. So a few of the years I did part-time. In the UK, we do have some less than full-time training programs yes. for undergraduate, and some consultants try to negotiate their job plans to work less than full-time. Yes. But again, there's this worry 
that we are no longer attracting sufficient numbers of men into the profession, that we're becoming unbalanced. But there's still some areas where there are very few women. I'm a cardiologist, and at the moment in the UK, only 9% of consultant cardiologists are women. Do you think there are still areas where there are barriers to specialisation for women in South Africa? There definitely are barriers, and I think for me the biggest problem is that um, people often do what they see someone who looks like them do. And for many years at Khrotiske there was only one African consultant, mm -hmm. and he was an orthopaedic surgeon. And at the time, anyone who was a student at UCT who was black, who you spoke to, wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I trained in Durban, and in Durban, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology was full of black uh, consultants. And I think Durban, of all the medical schools in the country, has produced the largest number of obstetricians. So I think we have to aim to improve the numbers of people who are specializing and who stay in academic medicine. That way, we'll achieve the aim of influencing younger people to go into some of these professions that are still under-traded. So we've got all these women who maybe have to work part-time yes. for a while. Mm. How can you sort of nurture them as, a, as, the, as the role models for the future? Okay. It's, it's a hard one because if they're only there part of the time and, and so on, I, I think it's very important that but, it, but I think it does work, and it, I mean, again, if you look at the Department of Obstetrics in, in here at UCT, there are lots of females, and as a result, a lot of the younger black women who've specialized, I mean, the younger black consultants are actually female. <laughs> I think it's also probably more female than, uh, than male. And, and, you know, when people are passionate about a the subject, they find ways to work around it, and I suppose it's just the work, the, 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 the challenge for the institution itself to create an environment that's enabling for people to achieve that. What about practical advice for balancing a career and a family? Have you got anything to offer? Absolutely. Here? Choose your husband right. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that. I've said that recently on the radio. <laughs> Choose the husband right. Make him do the bit of the yes, work. I think that's, that's but crucial. Other things, support, family support? You, you also have to sort of create an environment for yourself that is supportive. Uh, negotiate with people, have uh, sharing with other mothers, mm -hmm. share lifts and share childcare. You know, there are ways that it can be done. I think this is a really exciting place here in Cape Town and a place where there's been traditionally a lot of links between my own university and um, the university here. And I think um, our medical school at a time when we're undergoing curriculum review can learn a lot from hearing what's going on here because some of it is preempting what's going to be required back in London. So thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.